Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. With us today on our game day segment is the angel of the big house, beat writer Angelique Shengelis from the Detroit News. Before she joins us, let's start as we always do with my view from Section 17. How sweet it was to be back in the big house with 109,000 of the faithful. The weather was perfect and everyone was just glad to be home. The fact we won was icing on the cake. To be honest, I was surprised it was not a closer game. I thought Western had an offense that would put some points up and challenge us, and I wasn't sure what we would bring offensively. But our D was surprisingly good, and the offense, after a slow start, pounded the Broncos' defense into the ground. Now, I'm not going to overanalyze this one. It was a good win, but I'm not sure how much it means. It was just one game. We have to keep that in mind. The downer was the injury to Ronnie Bell. When I recorded with Angelique this morning, she was on her way to Jim's presser, so we were not sure about Ronnie's status. Now we know. It's an ACL injury that ends his season. Now we have to find someone or several someones to replace him. That will not be easy. He has been our best receiver for the last two years, was a leader on the team, and a captain. Like you, my heart breaks for Ronnie Bell. Football is a brutal game, and we now have to regroup and get ready for Washington. Yes, they suffered what many are calling the worst loss in program history to Montana on Saturday night, but they are a team that is loaded with talent, and I am sure they will come to the big house on Saturday night to play. My guest today says this is still a pivotal game for us. We have to focus on our game and not worry about Washington's issues. Up next on our game day segment is the angel of the big house, beat writer Angelique Shengelis from the Detroit News. So stay with us. with us on our game day segment as we look back at the opener with Western Michigan and I had a bit for the game Saturday against Washington is a beat writer Angelique Shingelis from the Detroit News. Once again, great to have you with us, Angelique. Mike, it was uh, really nice to be at that season opener in a 
pretty full of Michigan Stadium and knowing you were there. It was incredible, no doubt about it. As we spoke just uh, before we started taping, no one knew quite what to expect, but when the stands were filled uh, for kickoff, almost, student section was lagging a bit behind as usual, but it was a sight to behold, wasn't it? It really was, and I thought, well, maybe the student section would, would uh, really show up because classes started earlier than usual. They started last Monday, and usually they start the season with uh, classes yet to begin. So I, I was a little surprised that wasn't more full, but uh, yeah, I was really, I was because as we as we talked, I, I just had no idea what to expect and how would fans turn out. And now you've got to believe that the night game against Washington will will be even more impressive. Mm-hmm. So I think people got a very good good vibe, and it's the word that the players keep using. So now I'm applying it to the uh, to the fans at Michigan Stadium because it was a great vibe, and I, I think everybody was just so glad to be back. No, absolutely, and it should be. Um quite the scene Saturday night with uh, Washington coming in, even though they were uh, whacked by Montana. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, just for starters, I know you're on the way to uh, Jim's presser uh, this morning. We're taping on Monday morning. There's a lot to talk about, but the uh, the thing that I'm getting the most questions about is Ronnie Bell's injury. Would we expect an update uh, at the presser? I would think so. I I think Jim Harbaugh has been pretty consistent. Um, with sharing, especially if it's a, um, you know, God forbid, a season-ending injury, he is very forthcoming typically about that. I, I think he'll, you know, he may hold off a little bit about getting, giving details, but I suspect he will give an update. And, um, you know, I think everybody watched that, that play, watched the, the, the poor guy get, get a walk. I mean, he just, Ronnie Bell limped. It wasn't even ginger. It was just, you know, he's just trying to make it to the cart, the motorized cart that took him off the field. And, and watching watching him bow his head, and, I mean, just the anguish was was really palpable. And, and uh, you know, I, that's hard to see. And, and it's, it's a captain. He's he's your leading receiver the last two seasons. And to see that happen this early in the season, any time during the season, but – but this early was, was really heartbreaking for him. Well, we will find out uh, by the time we air tomorrow. We'll uh, have the Ronnie Bell news, so we can hope for the best. We will know, though. Other than that injury, which was very, very sad, uh, a lot of good things we saw from Michigan in the opener. Let me start with the defense, because that, for me, was the big surprise. I thought, hey, we're going to be in a shootout in this game, and we weren't. And Western Michigan, they have some very good skill players, especially um, Caleb Ellaby, a quarterback, it's no joke stopping them, is it? No, it isn't. And that's why, you know, I'm not a gambler, Mike, but uh, with the point spread, I took a Western Michigan with that, what was it, 17 and a half points? Mm-hmm. I, because I really thought it would be close. And because of Ellaby, I, you know, I know that they, they don't have Eskridge anymore. And, and he was a big part of, of that game plan last year and, and why they were so proficient offensively. But I didn't think they would miss a big beat. And, and you know, how much of that was, was Michigan's defense, I think, a lot. I mean, I, I think when you listen to Tim Lester's post-game press conference, they were watching Ravens film, trying to figure out how they were using Aiden Hutchinson, and, and he singled out Aiden a few times, just saying, you know, we just didn't know how to adjust to him, and they thought they finally did a little bit late in the third quarter, but, you know, they're saying, he, he was saying they're rushing four guys, and then Aiden's just blowing past, so, you know, he, he was just, he was a presence for them that they couldn't handle. And, and it wasn't just Hutchinson. I mean, you look at, at Dax Hill was all over the place. What he, Clean Scale, said they were going to do with him. You saw Nakai Hill Green have a really strong performance. It was, um, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a performance worth noting. But if you listen to the players after the game, Hutchinson and Vincent Gray, I mean, Vincent Gray is the one who said, look, there were a lot of mistakes there that people probably weren't aware of and, and that they were aware of. So they felt like they had, had plenty to learn from and, and to correct. Well, the big thing was in, in that word adjustments uh, that you, mm-hmm. you mentioned, and I, I was watching you and Wojo uh, on my Detroit News app after the game, and <laughs> that's the word you used uh, as adjustments because those first few series, Western was moving the ball, and I was thinking, this is not good. They are slicing through us like butter. M- Coach McDonald adjusted that defense. That's not something we've seen over the last few years, is it? <laughs> no, it really isn't. And, and I know people don't want to say it, but you know, Don Brown, that was, I, I think he was stubborn in, in that sense. You know, he didn't, he didn't make those adjustments quickly. I think they eventually would make some, but 
Um, I, I thought Mike McDonald, the one thing that, that Harbaugh praised him for, he said he was he was sort of cool and calm and collected and, and made the play calls seamlessly and, and made the adjustments quickly. And, and I think that that was refreshing for, for people to see from our Michigan defense. Um, does this, is this the blueprint for how the defense is going to look? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that there's more. I, I don't think they showed everything, but I think they gave a, a nice sampling platter of what this defense is going to look like. And Mike McDonald, I thought in his first game, Coleman plays did a really nice job. And going back to the word adjustments, we saw that from this defense. And, and I think that that is probably the biggest positive to take away. Another impressive aspect of that defensive performance was, I, I think something we were all worried about going in was what were we going to get from the secondary? Now, Dax Hill, I know what we're going to get from him. He was spectacular. Our corners, that's what I was focusing on because with a passing attack like Western has, those guys are going to get stressed in the opener. And I thought they held up really well. I did too, Mike. And, and we have to do these little matchups uh, before every game. And, and the key matchup I had was LB against against the corners. And I agree. I thought they did a really nice job. And, um, you know, as, as I got closer to the season, I started thinking, hmm, maybe, you know, I was thinking the secondary with the exception of Dax and, and maybe a couple other teams I thought would be, would be a weakness. But then I started thinking, oh, I don't know. These guys sound different. And I know that doesn't mean anything uh, until you see them on the field. But I just got the sense that, that maybe they really were learning. And I think Steve Clinkdale is a big difference maker. And uh, can he work magic in, in a few months that he's been here? I, yeah, I think so. And I, I thought that their play was really solid on Saturday, and uh, but that still definitely was, was the standout, but I, I think they got really good play from, from the corners, too. I, I really, that was a little bit surprising, but I, as I said, as I got closer to the game, I thought, I, I, I don't think they're going to be a weak link like they were last year. No, I was uh, very happy with their performance. You mentioned uh, Dax Hill, and uh, man, he was just all over the field, as Jim said, and Aiden Hutchinson, I thought, was incredible. He was, and you know, I think Aiden gets really frustrated. I remember after the uh, the Minnesota game, even the Michigan State game, you know, talking to his dad, and, and Aiden would, was really frustrated that he was getting there, getting there, but not making the play, you know, not getting the sack, which is what he was, of course, his goal, and, and he did finally get a sack uh, against Western Michigan, but he was so disruptive, and and he really was the, the focus of, of Tim Lester, the Western Michigan coach's comments after the game, and, you know, he is quick. He is, I think he likes he really likes the, the new ways they're using him. and um, But, you know, the bottom line is he's still his, his goal is to get after the quarterback. And uh, and, and I think that this, this was only going to show that he knows he got, he's got his feet wet. You know, the guy hadn't played since the Indiana game last year mm-hmm. and, and hadn't you know, since he broke the ankle and, and was held on a spring ball. So this guy's been really hungry uh, to get out there. And, and I think that that, uh, that first game certainly bodes well for this season. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just a great performance from him and the defense. I think we're all very pleased with what we saw, even though it's just one game. When you compare it to the last couple of years, especially with the energy and the intensity that we saw, they were having fun out there. That is a great point, Mike, and it was something I was thinking about earlier today. That You know, listening to people talk about the stadium experience, and, and the players did miss that, and and you can say, well, they need to generate their own enthusiasm. Other teams did last season. Well, that's true. But, uh, you know, I think they fed off of it. But it wasn't it, it wasn't just that. I, I remember watching the Minnesota game, and they were dominating last year. And they did not have, I don't know, I don't want to say a tenth of that, uh, that sideline enthusiasm. But it was definitely lacking last year, even though they were winning. And, and then they could not summon it when they were struggling in games. They couldn't get that... that that juice on the sideline and I I thought that was that was present from the get-go I mean just the way they came out and the way that they were congratulating each other on the field and you know sometimes you didn't see that last year and and guys were celebrating plays you know they didn't have the ball but they were doing the plays they were supposed to do and they were they were pumped up about that so I you know this is a team you hear it every summer Mike I mean Mm -hmm. I've done this for a long time and this is the closest team we've you know, I've ever been around, and uh, you know, I've, I've been played football for this many years, and I haven't seen like. And they said it, and this time I thought, yeah, I, I think that they really do mean it and feel it, and I think that they drew something from from Harbaugh taking the pay cut, revamping the staff, 
making changes, putting up, pushing all the chips in, and, and I think that they've responded to that as well. No, I agree with that. The difference was noticeable. So let's flip it over on the other side of the ball, Angela. You can talk about Caden McNamara and his performance. Uh, Jim said he was efficient. He said it in a positive way, though. I think when you say efficient, a lot of fans say, oh, you know, he's sort of uh, just getting by for right now until uh, JJ is ready. But he was 9 for 11. He made really good decisions, which I thought he did last year, too. That's one of the things I really like about him. And, you know, the bottom line was he didn't need to throw a lot anyway. No, and then that was the when they were saying last week that they want to be more physical, they want to run the ball, I did think they meant it. And it was coming from, from offensive linemen. And, uh, you know, I don't think they're, they're not certainly not going to be a one-trick pony. I mean, I, they're not going to just run the ball. But but you're right, Kate didn't need to do more, but he did do a lot. And, and being efficient is being smart. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's what Jim Harbaugh wants from his quarterback. I mean, certainly you want to see a J.J. McCarthy play like he had, of course, even though – you know, Jim. I think there was a little bit of a hold your breath, but I don't want to. I don't want to change the way he plays. <laughs> moment for Harbaugh, but but with Kate, I mean, since he's been playing since last year, I think it's the, the stat is sixty four percent of the drives he's led that have end up in, ended up in scores. Um, you know, I, I, and I think that that's that's really important. And eighty two passes without an interception, important. And and I think that's you you want a quarterback. You know, I know people don't like to hear game manager. Quarterbacks don't like to hear that. But you want a quarterback who's not going to make mistakes and who is going to make the right decision. Yeah. And I think that's what you have in Kate McNamara. Mm, absolutely. I agree with that. Well, those first few series, the uh, the offensive line was not getting a lot of push. That surprised mm-hmm. me a little bit because, uh, you know, Gaddis was pounding the ball. He just kept on doing that. But the line got better and better and really took control of that line of scrimmage in an impressive way as the game went on. I thought so, too. And, and you know, Zach, Zim, Zach Zinter has a broken hand, and, and he was in there, but Billy August started at right guard. So they had to do a little bit of shifting there, but with Keegan at left guard. But, yeah, I thought the offensive line got better. And um, yeah, I thought, you know, you're talking about the running the ball. I mean, the running backs, these are strong guys. And, of course, you need an offensive line to open holes. But these guys, are they can make things happen. And I, I think with the combination of the two, it, it certainly works well. And, and as the offensive line got its feet wet, got, got better and better, then I, I think that you know, the pressure was off the running backs to make things happen. But it's going to be interesting to see how when Zinter comes back. I mean, he is – Josh Gaddis has called him the best offensive lineman of the bunch. And I think the linemen would say that, too. Um, to see how different they are when he is is a regular player in that offensive line. Well, we got great play uh, in the long run from that offensive line, which led to impressive performances from Hassan Haskins and Blake Corum, and they really do look like they uh, they could be a nice one-two punch as the season rolls along, Angelique. Well, I think they would. You know, I know that Corum said that, and I, I think that Harbaugh would say, no, 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 they're a one-one punch, and and that's what uh, Carol Hutchins said about her pitchers last <laughs> season too. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, it's not because they don't want to hurt feelings, but I do think they feel that way. That with Haskins and Corum, they've got two guys who can be one and one, and uh, it, but they are change-ups, and and I thought you know Corum. He showed some of the speed that people have talked about. I mean, he got stronger, if that was possible, but, but he was fast. And Haskins, and it's not only the way they ran the ball. I mean, there were a couple blocks that were just really impressive that those two had. And, um, you know, on the one A.J. Henning, uh, his play, I believe it was his play, um, Haskins was in on, on, a, on a big block that really opened that. And, um, you know, I think that, then you see Donovan Edwards. Everybody wants to see him. He came in later, and he's. Yeah, I thought that was important for JJ and Donovan to get playing time. But but back to Haskins and Corum, I thought they would be really good. And again, it's one game, so you got to see how this goes uh, going these next few these next few weeks. But I, I think with Mike Hart coaching them, I think that's already you're seeing a difference. I think that they believe in Mike Hart. They take his coaching. And, and then you're hearing from other players, you know, that, talking to him about, about blitz pickups. And so I think he's been an absolutely vital addition to this staff. And, and I think it's going to show in the way these, this running game goes. Well, it looks like the, uh, the speed and space philosophy that we heard about three years ago from Josh Gaddis might be somewhat on the back burner. Because I know the first game you want to establish an identity. 
Last year, a, a lot of people, a lot of analysts around the country said Michigan is a team without an identity on offense, and it's been that way for several years. If they were searching for an identity, it looks like a return to physical smash mouth football, doesn't it? It does. And then I, last week, I asked, um, I, I think it was Trevor Keegan. I, you know, I asked. I said, you know, usually, you a team can determine its identity about three or four weeks into the season, I, and you know, does this team have one already? And and he didn't hesitate, Mike. I mean, he said it's to be physical, and and he didn't say smash mouth, but that's that's what he was saying. And run the ball, run the ball down their throats is what he said. And uh, I think people took exception to that. And you know, you, you saw a fan reaction. I'm sure you saw it saying, "Oh, here we go. What is this? What year is this?" And and I do remember when Gaddis came in and we were interviewing um, Jay Harbaugh. And, and I said, well, what does this mean about the run game? And he goes, no, 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 no. When you talk to Josh Gaddis, he says it starts, even when it was still speed and space, when that was the jargon everybody was using, he said it starts with the run game. So I don't think that they've departed or that Gaddis has departed from that philosophy, but I think that they are going to emphasize it because it does open things up in the past game. It does make, make Kate McNamara, you know, gives him, he doesn't have to do everything. And, and I thought that was something else they stressed this year is, is teaching the quarterback they don't have to win the game. It's not always on their shoulders. And, you know, you got to let the other guys do, do their job. It's a compliment and a complimentary offense, I mean. And um, so, I, I, you know, I like I, – I don't know if I'm old school because, you know, people are like, what year is it? But I, I like a physical – I like that perspective, that, that approach – and and that uh, that identity. Oh, absolutely, I do too. And it, it's it's some things just never change in football. If you can run the football, that frees up the passing game. It changes everything. It changes everything, Mike. And look at some of these games the last two seasons, especially in the fourth quarter when they needed that they needed that first down, and you know it's third and four or five, and they weren't getting it. And you know that's when you need a a bulldozing. Rush, rushing game and that was lacking and of course again it's one game and they haven't been put to the test late in the game to see what they can get those kind of yards but I, I think that, that that is definitely the approach you have to take entering a season and, and for the reason you just said because it opens everything else up. Well I know uh, as you mentioned it was just one game we have to be very careful with that and I know a lot of the fan base and even a lot of the national media people were quick to say that and that it was a win against a MAC team. You're always going to hear that. That said, after the turmoil of the last 12 months, Michigan really needed a positive start to build the team's confidence. To me, uh, that's why the win Saturday was very important. Angelique, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, Mike. And and it was it was even just starting fast and scoring fast. And I mean, how many times did you see Michigan get down by a lot early? last season and you know yes the defense gave up the the immediate touchdown and David Ojabo had the, had the really you know the unsportsmanlike penalty that was pretty silly to get and um, you know the defense it was interesting Aiden said you know the defense sort of like got deflated at that point then they realized oh, okay you got to suck it up and and they played much differently after that first that opening uh, scoring drive by Western Michigan but Yes, I mean it was about building confidence, and and interestingly though, you know, I, I I don't know what it was I asked Aiden after the game, but you know he said they haven't done a damn thing, and they're, they're not they're focused on the next game and and getting better, and I, I thought again that was the appropriate response for the reasons we just said. It's one game. It was uh, it was a Western Michigan team that was not as good as it was last year apparently. And um, and you take it for what it's worth, and and I think that was also the correct approach. They they took some confidence from this game. They got a win, but they also know that this is certainly not a finished product. Well, this Saturday, Washington comes to town for a big prime time night game, and to say that they are limping in would be an understatement. They lost thirteen to seven at a home to Montana. Yeah. Media folks in Seattle. I was reading one of their uh, beat writers. Uh, we're saying this or that was the worst loss in Washington <laughs> history. And it was shocking, wasn't it? It really was. And, and I watched most of that game. And it's funny, I, I, I watched two 
Pac-12 network games. I watched a little bit of Dylan McCaffrey uh, the night before, and, uh, and then I'm, I'm like, wow, I'm watching a lot of Pac-12. But, <laughs> yeah, I watched that that game, and, and you know, you see Giles Jackson near the end drop a pass, and um, it was it was unbelievable to see that happen. And certainly Michigan fans have seen something similar happen before, losing to a team like Montana. But, um, well, maybe not, actually. No, that – I'm not going to bring up the Appalachian State mm-hmm. game, but that was actually a really good team. And um, but I, I was stunned. And there, you know, talk about energy. There was I didn't sense any of that ever from the Washington side. And uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how they rebound from that and then travel east to, to play this game Saturday night. Some of the things that also surprised me about that game is Washington was playing without three of their top receivers. So I, I think yeah. you have to take that into account. As usual, I mean, two things can happen after a loss like that. The team packs it in or they come back angry and determined. I'm guessing it's going to be the latter with the Huskies because... Uh-huh. They have a ton of talent on this team, don't they? They do, and and going into this season, I I predicted a Washington win uh, against Michigan, and and I agree. I mean, you just you gotta you've got to what are, I don't know all the cliches, uh, circle the wagons, that kind of thing, Mike. I mean, that's what they have to do now, and and yes, it was they were missing receivers, three of them, as you mentioned, and um, I don't know what the status is going into this game. But they got to be better. I mean, they are better. We're ranked 20th in the preseason poll, and, and I'm not someone who really relies on the preseason poll, but there was a reason they were there. And um, I, it's going to be really interesting to see how they rebound from that because uh, that, that, was, that was a gut punch in a, in a big way. And, um, you know, and then traveling east, you, know, it's, you see Michigan teams going west and how hard that is. So it'll be uh, – I'm not sure what to expect. I think Michigan's favored by five now, mm-hmm. um, and it, it's a night game. The energy should be unbelievable, maze out, and um, you know it's it's 20th anniversary of 9/11. The band I did a story on the band last week, finally getting to perform again after after sitting out last year, and they've got an unbelievable show plan. So the energy is going to be going to be just crazy, but. You know, which Washington shows up, that'll be really the tell. That will be the uh, the question uh, heading into that game. So, final question for you, Angelique, before we uh, let you get away to uh, Jim's presser uh, there in Ann Arbor. Most of us thought before the season started uh, that this Washington game would be a, a really good, give us a good indication, I should say, of just where Michigan is as a team. But given what happened to <laughs> the Huskies on Saturday night, do you still think that's the case? I do. And, you know, not only just how they perform, but just, you know, the one thing they, they talked about is like last year, they felt they felt really way too good for about themselves after beating Minnesota. And a lot of them would say that they came back and, and they just underestimated Michigan State. They overestimated themselves. I, I think they just they can't. They have to ignore uh, that, that Washington lost this game. And, and they've got to just play, focus on themselves. Michigan has to just be really conscientious about how they're playing, how they're keeping their energy up. And, and I think that's going to be important. Just, you know, are they mature? And so, yes, I do think they're going to learn this is going to be a benchmark game for that reason and how they stay in it, in it mentally, but certainly how they perform against a, a team that I, we, I think we think is better than Western Michigan. And um, I, I think that they probably – I don't think they were vanilla on, on uh, in the opener, but I think that they've got a lot more to show. Well, absolutely. Uh, I think everyone's looking forward to it. I mean, the kids you know are ready for a primetime game. Uh, it's going to be a maze out. The uh, special halftime show from the band, it's, uh, it's what college football is all about. Absolutely. With us on our game day segment this week, uh, just looking back at the Western game and ahead a bit to uh, Saturday's big one has been beat writer Angelique Shingelis from the Detroit News. Angelique, as always, thank you for being gracious with your time driving to the press conference uh, this morning. Uh, we appreciate that, and we look forward to getting you back on the show soon. Yeah, the, the press conference was a little bit earlier than, than we expected when we planned this, so I apologize if uh, it was noisy as I drive to Ann Arbor, but I appreciate it, Mike, as always.
On Quick Hits today, other than the Ronnie Bell injury news, there was nothing else of note mentioned on the injury front at Jim's presser on Monday. On Thursday, I'll be back with our Visitor's Edition. Joining me will be the radio play-by-play voice of the Huskies, Tony Castricone. We'll also have the weather update for the game and some fun game day facts. It should be an incredible night at the Big House. The band will also present a halftime show that is being billed as a very special tribute on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. It should be an amazing night. Beating Western was nice. But beating Washington would be even more impressive. Despite their loss to Montana, they are a team absolutely loaded with talent, and I can't wait to see it. Don't forget our show app is available from the Google and iTunes stores. You can also hear us on Spotify, Odyssey, Spreaker, and anywhere else you get your podcasts from. That will do it for now. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Again, don't forget to join me on Thursday for our Washington Visitors Edition show with the radio play-by-play voice of the Huskies, Tony Castricone. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!